for the great hope we have. It's all because of your love and your grace and your mercy. Hallelujah. From sinking sand you lifted us with a tender hand. We are so grateful tonight for the goodness of God. Your love makes all the difference. Thank you, Jesus. Once we were strangers, pilgrims, and outcasts, sinner by choice and an alien by birth, but now we've been adopted. God, we got to give you glory tonight. Hallelujah. What a privilege to be in this place of worship and to be with your people, but more to feel the presence of the Lord is so rich in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for spirit lives. Thank you for health and for strength. Thank you for food, for shelter, for raiment. We have so much to be thankful for. In spite of the obstacles and the cares and the trials, God, you have been so awesome to us. Great is thy faithfulness. And we give you all the glory. Thank you for healing our bodies. Lord, those who are going through difficulties tonight with respect to their health, we thank you for their healing. In the name of Jesus, cause them to know that you're with them and you're a God who keeps your word. As we gather tonight for this study in this most important book in the Bible, Lord, we ask that you just touch Sister Net, God, use her tonight. We know you will. But then as we sit to listen, stir our hearts, Lord, to be more like thee. Oh, we feel the richness of your presence. Thank God. Encourage every discouraged heart. Let our faith be in you because we cannot be defeated. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are his everlasting arms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How excellent is thy name tonight. Ah, Jesus, we give you glory. I think we should just worship him for a season before Sustanet comes. Hallelujah. Come on, after a, a long day. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. You're awesome in this place, mighty God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I will praise the name that is worthy. I will praise your wonderful name. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. Without further ado, I'm going to invite our teacher to come. And handouts are there for you. I just want to give thanks to God for all things. Amen. Amazing God. Hallelujah. God bless you, tonight. Amen.
Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I am so grateful to God for this privilege one more time. I want to greet Pastor and Lady Jennifer, Pastor Omar and Dr. Michelle, and every one of us who are here. I want to greet you as well, Sister Maxine. Yes, Sister Maxine, I greet you too. <laughs> I want to greet everybody in the name of Jesus. For all of all who are um, viewing online, I want to give God thanks for you. I looked behind before I came up here and I saw Mrs. Diane Walker. I want to greet you. Can you please stand so that we can see who you are? I had the pleasure of talking with her recently, and she's a charming lady. Please make her welcome. I'm claiming her in the name of Jesus, because she's looking for a church home, and I think she has found it. Amen. Is there any other visitor with us tonight? Anybody who is not a member of our congregation who is here? Praise God. Welcome, welcome. We welcome you to Bible study, welcome you to Pentecostal Tabernacle, and we hope you'll come again. Amen? Thank you so very much. So, tonight I'm delivering a lesson that was delivered to me by Pastor Omar, so I stand here in his stead to do this. Uh, but before I do, I want to take a moment to just give a brief report. We often ask for prayer requests and we don't very often get the benefit of hearing what God has done. So since I'm here, I want to take this opportunity. A family member of mine was shot in Jamaica during a robbery recently. It happened in the beginning of January, the night before I came back from that trip. And um, we've been praying, the church has been praying and I want to thank the church for prayer. I had to be back in Jamaica last weekend on a family, for a family event, and I saw him. He walked towards me. So I want to tell you, he's out of the hospital, praise God. And more than that, I want to give a report of what he said happened on the journey, the 40-minute ride off the hill in Malvern down to Black River to the hospital. He told me that he was conscious, but at one point it got very dark, and he closed his eyes, and he felt like he was going, and a voice said to him twice, hold on, hold on, keep your eyes open. And he said he opened his, he made a deliberate attempt to open his eye. Now, this is a man who was bleeding internally from a gunshot wound in his abdomen. And he said, again, it happened, it got dark. And he said to me, Annette, I felt like I was going. And the voice said a second time, hold on, hold on, call Dr. Imaru. And he was mindful enough to take his phone, call his sister-in-law, and said, a voice told me to call Imaru. And when they got to the Black River Hospital, Dr. Imaru was already there did surgery and removed four liters of blood from his abdomen. He is alive, walking slowly, but alive. And so I wanna thank you for your prayers. And I wanna remind you that God still answers prayers. Not only does he answer prayer, but in a lesson tonight, I'm gonna to be talking about the long suffering nature of God. God still gives opportunity to mankind Thank you, Jesus. to make changes and to turn to him. So I give God thanks. I give God praise. I thank him for a praying church, and I thank him for answering prayer. Yeah. Amen. So tonight I'm going to be talking about God's righteous judgment. We're looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Technology, don't do this to me.
I'm sorry. Give me a moment, please. Did I see Kenny's in here recently? I'm so sorry, my computer has frozen. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna try and do, sir. And it is frozen. Pastor, I just gave a praise report. You wanna raise a song for me, please, sir? My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what Thank you so much, Pastor. Thanks for your patience. All right, so we are in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. And in chapter 1, God showed that he gave instructions on right living, but that humanity did not obey him, but plunged into immorality. So when chapter 2 begins... Therefore, you are inexcusable, O oh man. I want us to recognize that chapter 2 is referring to everything that was outlined in chapter 1. All right? So after Paul dealt with the moral de degeneracy of humanity, and especially pagans in Romans 1, he proceeds to speak of God's impending judgment for human sins. And it is clear in this section that Paul was addressing both Jews and Gentiles. He addressed God's judgment on Gentile sin, and he addressed God's judgment on Jew sin. So both Jews and Gentiles have their sin problems in their unique situations, and they both stand equally before God's judgment. 
So Paul wrote to them in three sections. He covered the inescapable nature of God's judgment, the impartial nature of God's judgment, and the internal nature of God's judgment. And the lesson tonight is going to fall under those three categories. So let's look first at the inescapable nature of God's judgment. All people, both Jews and Gentiles, will stand equally before the inescapable judgment of God. Judgment is appointed for all people. There is no exception to that. Romans 2, starting from verse 1. It's on the screen, you can read together. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So scholars ascribe this judgment attitude to two groups of people impacting the Roman church. The self-righteous Jewish legalists. They thought that they were free from judgment because they were God's chosen people. Then you have the Greek moralists, the Gentiles who were generally morally upstanding in their conduct. And both these groups were apt to judge others. In other words, they are judging one another because of where they think they stand in God. I, I believe in our day and age, we have to be careful because there is some of this in all of us. By their judging others who were guilty of flagrant sins as referred in Romans 1, they were condemning themselves. Why? Because they practice other sins like pride. So they may not have done some of the outwardly obvious sins, but there was pride. Because they also practiced some of the same sins of the people that they frowned on. The Jews practiced idolatry. And we see there, even the law became an idol. The Gentiles also practiced idolatry because they were caught up with their own morality and philosophy. And neither would escape God's righteous judgment. See, we have to always be reminded that anything that we put before God becomes an idol. One who reads the list of sins in Romans 1, 29 to 32 cannot escape the fact that each person is guilty of at least one of them. There are sins of the flesh and of the spirit, and we see that in 2 Corinthians 7.1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sometimes we are quick to judge based on sins of the flesh and forgetting that there are also sins of the spirit that we are guilty of as well. Then you have the prodigal sons and the elder brother. We see that story in Luke 15, 11 to 32. Those who sin outwardly, for example, by righteous living, and those who sin inwardly because they have a bad heart, have a bad attitude. It's sin. So both the prodigal son and the elder brother were guilty of Sin, sin of the flesh, sin of the spirit. You have those who leave the house and sin, and those who stay in the house and sin. And in condemning the Gentiles for their sins, the Jews were really condemning themselves. As the old saying puts it, when you point your finger at somebody else, 
at least three fingers are pointing back at you. So this is a fact that we need to be mindful of. And while we admonish, instruct, and give counsel, which we should do, we should be careful not to condemn. Condemning is a point at which you pronounce a sentence when you declare someone to be unfit for whatever that is. When you provide evidence for an adverse judgment against. In effect, condemning leaves no room for mercy. So while we, again I repeat, admonish, instruct, and give counsel, we should draw the line at condemning. Not only is God's judgment certain for all people, but God's judgment is always correct. If we begin to judge, we can't say that. Our judgment would not be always correct. And this is the reason why we need to leave that to God. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. That's how we judge. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This is in reference to Jesus. Yes, he is a loving God, but he's also a God who judges. God's judgment is according to truth as evidence in relation to facts. So God will judge those who are guilty, not according to appearance, but in integrity and with righteousness. He will judge people according to the real nature of their conduct, conduct, and not as their conduct may appear to people. The secret as well as the open sinner, therefore, the hypocrite as well as the abandoned profligate, must expect to be judged according to their true character. And this is a quote from Albert Barnes. So we have already discussed that the Jews and Gentiles who condemned others also secretly did some of the same sins and or other sins. So they should not think they will escape the judgment of God. Neither should we. So this is a reference in Romans 2.1 at the start of that chapter where it is being point, uh, pointed out you are inexcusable because if you're doing the same thing and you're judging others, you also will face the judgment of God. The Jews thought that they could escape judgment because in their rabbinical creed it is written, and I quote, all Israel have a portion in the world to come except heretics and deriders of the wise men. So as far as they're concerned, they've got it made. Their place is secured. And I wonder, how many of us feel like that? We have to be careful of that thought process, that philosophy, and that doctrine. No human will escape God's judgment. Those who accept salvation will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. And I quote, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That is the word of God. And I know we like, to, we like the loving aspect of the word of God as it relates to our God. But we have to also, if we accept that, accept God is a God of judgment. Those who are not saved will appear before the white throne judgment. And we see that record in Revelations 20, 
11 to 15. But before God judges, God always gives goodness. Psalm 78, 38 says, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. And verse 39 tells us why. It says, For he remembered that they were but flesh. Psalm, Psalm 78 is referring to God's goodness to rebellious Israel. Regarding their covenant with God, they were unfaithful, but he was long-suffering and full of mercy. I think we should just thank God for his long-suffering nature because God really has been long-suffering to us. It's not just Israel alone. God's goodness is long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrath. His goodness is forbearing. It's a holding back of judgment. We see as in the days of Noah, 1 Peter 3.20, and in our present age, 2 Peter 3, 9 to 15, 9 to 15. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So a reality check for us. If God was not long-suffering, I wonder how many of us would still be here? Or how many of us would already have been consumed by his wrath? So we thank God that he is long suffering and can we in turn follow his example and do the same to our fellow human beings remember this admonishment is about not condemning not being judgmental because we stand as sinners saved by God's grace and mercy amen so how do we respond to God's delayed judgment? One, there is ill treatment of God's goodness. We despise or think lightly of or spurn God's goodness as if we are entitled to it. People mistake God's forbearing goodness as a reason to continue sinning. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 to 13 says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a time coming. He may be long-suffering now, but there is a time coming. And so it behooves us not to take God's mercy and goodness for granted. What is the intent of God's goodness? His goodness and giving of time is intended to cause people to repent, change of heart, mind and life God's undeserved goodness should lead to conversion and this is why I, I don't hesitate in saying to anybody who says that they have been given a chance that they need to stop to think why why do you still have God's breath in your body it's not to continue doing what you always had been doing if you were not living for God you got another chance to turn, to repent, to come into right relationship with God. Delayed judgment is time given to allow man to conform to God's original intent. So God demonstrates that it is not judgment or condemnation that brings people to change. It is goodness grace and mercy. 
God in his wisdom has chosen not to use a sledgehammer approach to bring about change. Instead, he uses a love approach. So why then should we, mere human beings, who did not create anybody, cannot create anybody, as much as they have tried, they have not been able to put the breath of life in anybody. Why should we then be judgmental and condemning when God, the creator, the savior, the king, has chosen the love approach? The lesson of Romans chapter 2 is that grace and mercy is more powerful than judgment and condemnation. So the second thing we're going to look at is the impartial nature of God's judgment. God will not give any preferential treatment to any people group in terms of the principles of judgment. Everyone will be judged on their adherence to God's revealed will to them. Let's look at Romans 2. We're going to start reading at verse 5. And we can read together. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Aren't we thankful for that? So in verses 5 to 11, Paul explained a fundamental truth about God's judgment. God's judgment is impartial. Although we are not saved by our deeds, salvation should produce good deeds in us. And we want to make that very clear. We are not by any means suggesting that your deeds will save you. But after all that God has done, and the opportunity to be saved, and the opportunity to be in relationship with him, and the hope of eternal life, and the hope of being with him in eternity, and even if that were not so, the peace and the joy that we have by being able to live this kind of life in this crazy world, there should be a response from us that produces good works and good deeds. Amen? God judges according to deeds just as he judges according to truth. Now, I didn't say deeds will save you, but he judges according to deeds. Paul intimates that God will judge humans by our consistent character and conduct. That's how we determine our judgment. Whatever the final judgment that we will receive against God's revealed will, it will be according to our hearts and actions. If our hearts are stubborn and unrepentant, we are storing up existential wrath until the day of eschatological wrath. Existential meaning it's based on our human experience. Eschatological, it's based on the end, based on the final judgment. So Christ will judge all people rightly and justly, giving rewards to those who lived rightly and punishment to those living in error. We cannot expect good from the hand of God and not expect some kind of punishment when we contravene his law. 
that, that would be a totally unbalanced way to exist. Right? It's the other side of the same coin. So what's the reward? The reward is eternal life in God's joyful presence. Recipients are those who consistently persevere in good character and conduct. Those who intentionally strive for glory, that is God's character and beauty and honor and immortality. Now, you can't do this, intentionally strive for God's character and beauty, God's honor, and strive for immortality without obeying the word of God. So, in effect, the recipient is a person who obeys the instruction in the word of God. And a part of that instruction tells you what to do to inherit eternal life. Amen? Punishment is indignation and wrath in eternal torment, separated from God's joyful presence. Who will participate in that? Those who are consistently rebellious toward God. Those who are disobedient to God's truth. In other words, you don't obey the truth of the word of God. Those who rather obey unrighteousness, yielding themselves consistently to iniquity. So my answer to critics who say, how could a righteous God put people in hell for eternity? Is God putting people in hell? The choice you make is putting you in hell. There is an open door. There is instruction that will direct you on this straight and narrow path. And contravening those laws, those rules, those instructions, is going to take you on the broad path. So if you make a choice not to obey, God has not put you in hell. It wouldn't be God putting me in hell. I would have made a cho choice to go on that broad path. And I have the same amount of opportunity and responsibility to make the other choice to go on the straight and narrow way. So what's the punishment? Tribulation and anguish, the external and internal pains of eternal punishment. Who will receive that? Every errant soul, whether Jew or Gentile. We keep seeing the reference to the Jew first. That's because they were first favored with light and knowledge of truth. But we see also to the Gentiles, because since creation and conscience testified to them, they and they also received the gospel. So one group was favored by God. Another group from creation had conscience as a guide, and then they received the gospel. See, we would like to believe that hell is not what the Bible says it is. We would like to believe that, because who, who wants to consider going to a place of eternal torment? So there are all kinds of philosophies about there explaining what hell really is. Some say it's what you're going through here on earth. There are all kinds of philosophies. Because our mortal minds cannot conceive of eternity. Whether it is in heaven or in hell. But what we need to think of is eternal punishment in the light of the word of God. Not in terms of our limited concept. Mark 9.44 in referring to hell speaks of the fire that should never be quenched. Verse 44 states, Where their worm that is of their anguished conscience does not die and the fire that is of the lake that was referred to earlier is not quenched. So I am not a deep Bible scholar. But if I read that, I'm going to take it as it says. 
this fire is not going to be quenched. So whatever I need to do to escape that, just in case it's really permanent, I'm going to escape it. Amen? Reward, glory, honor, and peace, the sum of eternal bliss and blessedness. Who are the recipients? Everyone who believes what is good and behaves in a way that is good. Jew first, and also to the Gentile is repeated again for emphasis. See, there is no respecter of person or partiality with God. God is just in dealing with humans. Thea refers to partiality as the fault of one who, when called on to give judgment, has respect of the outward circumstances of man and not to their intrinsic merits, and so prefers, as the more worthy, one who is, for example, rich or highborn or a powerful to another who does not have these qualities. See, this definition of partiality does not apply to how God executes judgment. We are guilty of partiality in our dealings with each other. But we should strive to be like God in this regard. So again, I submit to you that this is another reason why we should not take on the task of judging. We don't have the capacity to be absolutely impartial. We are influenced by some of these things that Thayer references. Who is rich? Who is highborn? Who pays the most tithes? You know, who will help us out if we are in trouble? Who is nice to us? You know, who will tell me that I look nice even if I don't? Those things impact us in our humanity. We don't have the capacity to be totally impartial when we're, when we're judging. The third thing we want to look at is the internal nature of God's judgment. God will judge all people based upon the condition of their hearts towards God and the moral truths God has revealed to them. Character and motives are critical. Let us read from verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these also, not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but I must confess that those few verses sound very confusing. Am I the only person? That's why I love Bible study. So let's see if we can go through that. God will hold all humans responsible for their sinful behavior. Those without the law in this reference was referring to Gentiles, because the Gentiles were not subject to the Mosaic law, will still be judged even if not exposed to the Old Testament or the gospel. All people have some knowledge of God. Do you believe that? Word of God tells us that creation declares the glory of God. Everything around you tells you that there is a God. Then there is conscience, which is an innate moral sense. And you can look at Romans 1, 18 to 19 and 2, 14 to 15. Now, I don't remember if it was last week or on Sunday, but I remember Pastor Omar making a reference to a child 
And we all know that those of us who are parents or if you deal with children, that children innately know what is right and what is wrong. That's conscience. That's what God has given us as a guide. Even before they're socialized, right, Dr. Sharp? Even before anybody teaches them certain things. They're about to do something, can't even talk good, and they look at you when they're about to touch something they know they shouldn't touch. There is conscience in us that tells us what is right or wrong. And we can stifle that. That's, God, that's God's law in us. Nature teaches us, thank you, sir, what God desires. And according to Dr. Bob Utley, the tragedy is that all have willfully violated the light that they have. So God will hold all humans responsible for their sinful behaviors. Those with the law, the Jews, will be judged by the standard of the greater light and privileges they had in the written law of God. They sin within the law. They sin even though they knew the explicit revealed will of God. And they will be judged by the standard of the law that they have. In addition, all humans have natural law of God in their hearts. God will judge us based on that as well. So what does not justify us before God? Merely being a scholar of the law or God's word will not justify us. Being one who hears the word publicly read is not going to justify us. It follows, therefore, that church attendance does not justify us before God. Am I saying don't attend church? No, that's not what I'm saying. Hear me out. Going to Bible school or sem seminary does not justify us before God. Even standing here with a mic in your hand teaching the word of God does not justify us before God. So therefore, what justifies us before God? Who is justified? So, those who did the law, the ancient Jews, those who are generally obedient to God's revealed will in their context, and the Jewish Shema meant hearing to practice. So it is not the hearing, the reading, the teaching, but it's the practicing of, it's the doing. James advocated hearing and doing God's word. So James advocates the same principles in this dispensation as was advocated in the Shema. Put into practice what you hear. That is what is going to justify us before God. Romans 2.14, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it. God has given to all humans an inner moral law for which they are accountable to God to obey. Remember the word conscience. Some of this is seen in societal norms and laws, some of which are common across cultures. So, Utley comments that the verse in Romans 2.14 was not meant to imply that you can be right with God if you live in light of your culture, but that you are responsible for the innate knowledge of God. I want to share a quote from a paper. I'm quoting Omar Williams paper entitled Public Policy is the Moral Minimum of Society. 
Public policy forms external structures to delineate what is legally correct behavior for a society. There are points of convergence between morality, ethics, and law, but it is moral knowledge and ethical thinking that enable subjection to law. Otherwise, laws would never be breached if their existent, existence had inherent power over human behavior. So the point there, just like it was with the children of Israel, laws in, in and of, of itself does not have power over human behavior. I continue also, public policy does contain some moral aspects of natural law. For example, there is a universal prohibition against murder. Yet morality exceeds public policy in the broad scope of issues it deals with, including sexual promiscuity and sexual orientation, which are not legislated in most of the free world. I want to jump down to, okay, next slide. There is greater insight of right and wrong revealed in human conscience by the natural law of God than contained in social law. Paul makes plain that there are activities which are legal according to public policy, but are not good or profitable from an ethical outlook. And you can look at 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 10, 23 for that. Therefore, not all legal issues are moral, and not all moral issues are codified in law. So the greater authority is always God's law, whether natural, as in conscience, or written. What am I saying? God's law, morality, may be included in the laws in your society, or it may not be. And a lot of God's laws may not be included. God's law must always supersede. God's law as a child of God is what we obey. So you can't use as an excuse that this particular phenomenon that is getting popular now is legal as a child of God because that is not the ultimate law that you respond to. So while we are expected to obey the laws of the land, that's as long as it does not contravene the law of God. And we need to be very clear about that. So let us not be confused by the current state of societal laws. If at any point they contravene the word of God, we have a higher authority to which we are answerable. And it's, I know it's been said a few times and alluded to even from when we were studying Acts last year. If there is ever going to be a challenge to the church of God, and to preachers of the word of God, it is going to come from the difference between the laws of society and the laws of God. And that's where we're going to have to be prepared to take a stand. Verse 15 further clarifies Paul's meaning in verse 14. To be clear, only scripture enlightened by God's spirit can be fully trusted to guide human life. However, God's natural law, from which God's written laws and words derive, are written in hearts. This inner moral voice is called the conscience, which has two functions. It confirms rightness of our character or conduct, and it convicts from morally wrong attitudes and actions. We know a lot of times we are going to do something. There is an inner voice telling us we shouldn't do it. We know that but we go against it sometimes. So to be sure, fallenness has affected our conscience. Because man is in a fallen state, our conscience are seared. However, creation and this inner moral law are all the knowledge of God that some humans possess. Paul cited Greek philosophers in his epistles 
who demonstrated God's work through natural law. And you see those refer references there, you can refer to them. Though God has his work within every man resulting in conscience, man can corrupt that work so that conscience now varies from person to person and our consciences can be damaged but it can also be restored in Christ. If our conscience is condemning us wrongly, we can take comfort in the idea that God is greater than our heart. Romans 2.16, and this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God through Christ Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. Paul's gospel teaches the truth of God's coming day of wrath and how God will judge people in truth. On judgment day, God, who is revealed in Jesus Christ, who knows the hearts of all people, will bring both their motives and actions into judicial review. God will judge them by the revealed will of God to them. See, we cannot fully understand the love of God, which we experience every day. It's really hard for us to comprehend a love like that. So how then do we expect to fully understand the judgment of God? We have to accept and believe that he is love. And in like manner, we have to accept and believe what his word teaches about his judgment. We cannot comprehend it, therefore we should leave it to him. This is the reason why, and I go back to Romans 2 verse 1, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. I have thought about that very frequently preparing for this lesson because every time I start listening to Romans 2 it's the first thing I'm hearing and it is it's reminding me and convicting me and has stirred in my memory times when I was judgmental and so it's kind of like a slap across the face both sides who are you to be judging God's creation Deuteronomy 29 29 the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. The things of nature and providence which are plain and manifest are for our use and instruction and especially the word and ordinances of God, which are the revelation of his will, the doctrines and promises contained in the scriptures, each of the duties of religion and the commandments of God, such as are of eternal obligation, which may be chiefly designed because it follows. My brothers and sisters, the instruction of Romans 2 is very clear. The loving God of John 3.16 is the same God who is a God of judgment. So we know that we all stand, will stand before the judgment seat of God. So we will leave judgment to that time when God is judging. And in the meantime, I want to encourage us to help each other support each other, admonish each other, teach, counsel, so that when we stand before the judgment seat of God, our works will speak for us, the choices we make will speak for us, and our reward will be eternity with him. Let us not be quick to cast anybody off, to cast judgment and condemnation on anyone because as we judge others, we are being judged. Amen? Those are my few words on Romans 2, 1 to 16. And if there are any questions, we can entertain them at this time.
If there are questions that can be answered here, and if not, there's an email there you can send your questions to. Questions or brief comments we can take at this time. Amen. And if there are none, Pastor Stewart, I hand over to you. Thank you for your attention. I'm hoping it's because we are convicted by this lesson why there, <laughs> there are no questions. Maybe we're all examining ourselves, Pastor which is not a bad thing, because the word should do that to us. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I know when pastor comes up here, he'll get some questions, but that's the time to ask them. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. That's good. Thank you, Sister Ned. Uh, what, a, what an amazing chapter. Uh, the takeaway, I think, from chapter 2, of course, you know, chapter 2 is a continuation of chapter 1. And if you read the last section of chapter 1, you'll see where it leads into. The, the thing that comes home very forcefully to me is that all of us who desire to live for God, we're going to have to live in obedience to the Word of God. Uh, because... From these days, people would make choices about what they want to hold on to and live by, and then judge others in other areas. This is why this is one of the reasons why we have so many different religions, because we all pick pieces that you know we want to measure on. But the truth of it is that. This word of God, and I like, if you, if you just take a moment to look at verse 2 of chapter 2, it says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things, referring back up to even parts of chapter 1. And I like the way Sister Annette dealt with the whole moral situation. Um, and... and this Bible, you have to take all of it. You have to take all of it. And um, portions of it are so very clear that we can't miss it. So thank you very much for that. And if you, if you, if you want to know how to live, check the Word of God. Measure yourself against the Word of God. Let the Word of God be what guides you and and do the judging. Amen? Praise God. And um, uh, that those verses from 17 to the end really deal very forcefully with the caution against hypocrisy. I want to be right. I don't want to just act. Amen? But I want to be right. Amen? Any, any other thoughts, consideration? You'd... Amen? Praise God. Thank God for the word. Amen. Just want to leave a few announcements here. First, I want to give God thanks for another evening when we can come to the house of God. And then for all those, all those who have joined us by um, media, and I know you are around the world, we want to thank you for tuning in tonight. And we trust that you enjoyed, well, not enjoyed, but, you know, sometimes we like to say enjoy, but you're challenged by the word. We, we shouldn't just enjoy the word. We should really allow the word. What's that word that you used tonight? There's, I miss it already. Um, practice. It wasn't practice. It was practice, right? It was practice, yes. Yes. Amen. Thank God. See? Remember work, if you push it sometime, it's old, but it comes back. Amen. Praise God. I want to leave a few announcements with you, and Yes, hearing the, hearing to practice. That was key, hearing to practice. We don't just hear it to get excited about it. And I, I sent out a text. Sometimes we just have commotion and no practice. 
but we need to we need to put it into practice. All right, the marriage ministry would like to remind all couples that your final payment for a night to remember scheduled for Friday, February 10th will be due this Sunday, February 5th. And what we want to do is that we want all the heirs of our church, all the, the we want to make sure that we have times of fellowship. So we're going to ask all of our couples, please try to support this and be here for it. And I'm certain that you'll have a, a, a wonderful time together. And um, the, it, it is due this coming Sunday. Tomorrow, our Spanish ministry has Bible study at 7.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And please remember to invite members, if you know members on the job or wherever you come in contact with them, invite them to our Hispanic community, Hispanic service, sorry, and they will be blessed of God. On Friday, well, let me read this. Pen Pentecostal Tabernacle of West Palm Beach, their evangelism department will be having three nights of revival services this Friday, February 3rd through Sunday, February 5th. And for more information, we want you to call the church office. But here's what I'd like for you to do. Because they, when we have stuff, they come. We're not as good with going. And I'd like a few of you. It's a, if you live in Fort Lauderdale, it's a short drive. Just get up, get off at um, Lake Worth Road, and it's 60, 60, 24, 60, 24. Lake Ward Road is not far from the turnpike. I'm going to be going, and um, I can take five if anybody wants to go with me. I, and I think we should go and support them on Friday night. Friday night. Friday night. Saturday, of course, you know, our Spanish ministry is having their anniversary services, and they will begin this Saturday. February 4th, under the theme, Restoring the Altar, and the service on Saturday will begin at 6.30. I would like for you to come to that service. Amen. Praise God. You don't have to speak Spanish to come. You'll feel it. Amen. And then on Sunday, our morning worship service will be combined and I like these services. Those online, those listening, and those who are here, I don't want anybody to stay home. I want you to be here. Because when we, is, we're going to the same heaven, right? I don't know what the language will be, but we'll understand it together. Amen? So I'm going to ask all of you to be here. This is a real great opportunity for us to come together and strengthen each other. And of course, we'll be having a guest speak all the way from Argentina and wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm just looking forward to it. Didn't we have a great time here Sunday? I think we need to do it again this Sunday. Amen? So we're going to invite all of you to come, all of you to be here. Invite a friend. Brethren, do you know that um, if you invite your friends out, the Lord will take care of the rest? And lives can be changed. So we, everybody needs to be here online, folks. See you on Sunday morning at 11.15. Well, we start at 9.30 with prayer. I'm going to invite you to come out to prayer. And then, of course, 10 o'clock, we have our Bible study and Christian education. Um, parents bring the kids out for classes, the adult class, and all the other classes will be meeting in the adult class. But Andrew will be teaching for us this coming Sunday morning. Looking forward to that. All right? So that's Sunday. And we want to see you here in the sanctuary. So let's be here. And the theme, I like the theme, restoring the altar. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank God for our visitors tonight. So good to have you here. And um, I just want to give God thanks for all that he is doing. I want you to remember uh, the Cloverleaf area. I don't, most of you have seen the pictures by now, but most of where we used to go to um, have worship and services, most of that is burnt out. 
and it must be difficult for those family members right now. So I want to remember them in prayer. And I know through care we have been dealing with some of that situation. Amen? Praise God. That's it, Sister Jen. Yes? All right. Okay. How many visitors do we have tonight apart from this walk? All right. We have... Are you, good to have you. God bless. So good to have you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. Would you stand with me, please? And I think Brother Kirby is praying the right song to go with a Bible study like this. And um, one, one important thing for all of us to do is to fix ourselves. Sometimes we're so busy, busy fixing everybody else. But Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy, tried and true. We're going to sing that once or twice, and then we're going to invite you to come and give. Remember, if you would like to go to West Palm Beach and you want to ride, me, just come let me know. But the rest of you, I'd like for you to jump in your cars, head up to West Palm Beach. Let's have a good crowd there on Friday night to be a blessing to them, all right? Amen. Praise God. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Rosa, let me come and ask you to pray for us. to dismiss us in prayer and just ask the Lord's blessing on our offering. Amen. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come yes. to you once again. Thank Lord, you. we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this Bible study tonight. We ask you, Lord Jesus, that you will open up our hearts and our minds that as we receive your words tonight, Lord God, that we will go, the words will go with us, Lord God, and your words will abide with us as we go, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, as we come to the end of this Bible study and we are about to go home now, we ask you, dear God, to take us home safely to our destination, Lord God, this night. And Father, again, we thank you for this offering we are about to collect. We ask you, Lord God, to bless the offering, Lord God, and use it to your service, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And everybody say amen. 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 Wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. God bless you so much. Come give us unto the Lord. And we just want to let you know that the Lord will strengthen and guide you all the way home. Ah, we have a new usher tonight.